All right, the next session is going to be with Shanna Dobson. This section is going to be called Dark Imaginarium. Shared intelligence as an infinity curiosity type. Um, I'll message Shanna, make sure that everything's good with the audio. Wow. Great talk so far. Welcome, Shanna. How are you doing? Hey, Neil. Doing good. Um... Awesome. Well, please take it away. Thank you for joining. Awesome. I know if you see my screen okay. Yep, looks perfect. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's such a great honor to be here. I'm learning so much. I'll be talking about um, an idea I had called Dark Imaginarium, where I'm trying to make shared intelligence, the concept of that, what I call an infinity curiosity type. So you were so gracious to link the paper so anyone can find more details um, there on Phil Archive. So I want to start with an a discussion about ontological commitment. So my first question is, might we re-examine our ontological commitments? So in particular, two of them. One, um, Sean Carroll said so amazingly, what cannot be known because it does not exist. So Sean Carroll says the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is often explained as saying that we cannot simultaneously know both the position and the velocity of any object, but the reality is deeper than that. It's not that we can't know position and momentum, it's that they don't even exist at the same time. The second one I want to examine is Lenny Susskind's quote, we are all behind someone else's event horizon. So Susskind has a brilliant idea of space-time emergence as the entanglement of two black holes and what emerges from that is called computational complexity. So the world is quantum, so every theory should be derivable strictly from the laws of quantum mechanics. One is going to give us the notion of shared, two is going to give us the notion of ecology. So what would an ontological commitment to dark look like? So my continual goal, as everybody knows, is to sustain a simultaneous experience and to understand why I currently cannot. To sustain a simultaneous experience would be to bypass the integrative system we call consciousness. So how would you attain a two consciousness in the sense of in category theory or an in consciousness? How would we actually develop something called like a two memory? So uh, my colleague Robert Pretner and I fleshed out something called in awareness, where we're sort of examining this idea. Mike Levin and all um, have repeatedly shown that planaria memory is not in the head. Where is the memory? Is memory a sustained superposition well, of what? And also, what is the structure of anamnesis? Could you have a superposition between memory and anamnesis? So I had a small dialogue with Chris Fields, the amazing Chris Fields. And I said, you know, what is the difference between these two questions? What is the waking state? And what is consciousness? Or could it be that these are entirely separate questions? So we're sort of in a mess either way. If there is a difference in these questions, then it is possible to sustain a waking state without consciousness and or a conscious state in a non-waking state. So imagine somehow being in a waking state under general anesthesia. Well, if these are not entirely different questions, then we could contend that consciousness is a form of a waking state or something along the lines of a waking state as a condition of a conscious state. So how can humans have delta waves, which are canonically indicative of unconscious deep sleep, and thus a non-waking state, in the REM state, the patterns of which are indistinguishable from a waking state? So we all know that general anesthesia, something like a propofol, can reduce the polyrhythmic uh, brain activity to one uniform hum. And we know there's as many theories about what anesthesia does to consciousness as there are anesthesiologists. But we've repeatedly posited consciousness as the proto-state. And I wanted to turn this idea on its head. Like, is consciousness so robust, or is it a delicate interference, or is it a delicate inference? Now, we know beginnings are always tricky, but what if sleep was the proto-state? So if, you know, if life is oceanic and it revolves in these deep pressures, would the pressure of, of getting onto land like squeeze the REM state into this full-blown waking state that we're engaging in right now, anybody who's listening? So then waking state would be something like an acceptation, which is, I think, uh, quite impressive. 
So it's in this mess that I attempt to define dark consciousness as a, mi a mixed frequency state of being self-aware or conscious, um, while simultaneously being in a deep sleep, specifically in three sleep. So the sleep as proto-state is quite, is quite strange. Um, the REM brain activity is indistinguishable from waking activity. And this sort of enchanted, it's enchanted me for a bit. The only difference is eye movements, so either blinking ver or versus lateral movement. So REM is naturally having mixed frequency brainwave states, but the NREM states and the REM states are starting to blur as delta waves are creeping into the REM um, state. Now, they've also found that sleep is a local phenomenon. So of course, I'm going to ask the Shanna questions. <laughs> so then who is sleeping? Who is remembering? Who is dreaming? Lucid dreaming is a quantum superposition, or is it a superposition or an integration? So in a sleep state, you know, can then, can we sustain a simultaneous experience? So must the I be knocked out in order to sustain this level of simultaneity? Dreaming, we know, is characteristic of unsynchronized brain activity. So is the question then, Mm, my eye cannot sustain a multi-consciousness, but my dark eye, my sleep eye can? You can reframe this in terms of uh, reporting mechanisms and say, perhaps we are conscious of things we don't think we are conscious of. So let's talk about what is dark. Um, a canonical definition of a dark theory or anything like this is like, um, you know, dark matter does not interact electromagnetically with matter. But I want to sort of play around with another idea of dark, um, coming from Deleuze's logic of sense, something he calls the paradox of infinite becoming, and which I'm going to read on the next slide. So what if dark was the simultaneity of a becoming that eludes the present? Let's hold on to that for a second. Is dark a resolution issue? That resolution is merely translation, breaking translational symmetry. So is dark a symmetry breaking issue? And if so, what symmetry? And are we actually looking at the wrong symmetry? Is dark a sustained quantum superposition, but of what again? Is dark a many worlds branch? Is dark the dolphin uni, uni hemispheric sleep mechanism? So I'll read uh, from Deleuze's Logic of Sense. <clears throat> Alice and Through the Looking Glass involve a category of very special things, events, pure events. When I say Alice becomes larger, I mean that she becomes larger than she was. By the same token, however, she becomes smaller than she is now. Certainly, she is not bigger and smaller at the same time. She is larger now. She was smaller before. But it is at the same moment that one becomes larger than one was and smaller than one becomes. This is the simultaneity of a becoming whose characteristic is to elude the present. Insofar as it eludes the present, becoming does not tolerate the separation or the distinction of before, after, or of past and future. It pertains to the essence of becoming, to move and pull in both directions at once. Alice does not grow without shrinking and vice versa. So good sense affirms that in all things, there is this determinable sense or direction. A paradox is the affirmation of both senses or directions at the same time. I continue. The paradox of this pure becoming with its capacity to elude the present is called the paradox of infinite identity. The infinite identity of both directions or senses at the same time, a future and past, of the day before and the day after, of more and less, of too much and not enough, of active and passive and of cause and effect. It is language which fixes the limit, the moment, for example, at which the excess begins, but it is language as well which transcends the limits and restores them to the infinite equivalence of an unlimited becoming. Hence the reversals which constitute Alice's adventures, the reversal becoming larger and becoming smaller. Which way, which way, asks Alice sensing that it is always in both directions at the same time, so that for once she stays the same through an optical illusion. The reversal of the day before and the day after, the present always being eluded, jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. The reversal of more and less, five nights are five times hotter than a single one, but they must be five times as cold for the same reason. The reversal of active and passive, do cats eat bats, is as good as do bats eat cats. The reversal of cause and effect, to be punished before having committed a fault, to cry before having pricked oneself, to serve looking glass cake before having divided up the servings. All these reversals as they appear in infinite identity have one consequence, the contesting of Alice's personal identity and the loss of her proper name. The loss of the proper name is the adventure which is repeated throughout Alice's adventures, hence infinite identity. 
So I take this and I'm going to formally define dark consciousness as a state of being conscious while simultaneously being in deep sleep, specifically in three, where dark is going to be a twofold hybrid, the simultaneity of infinite identity and of a becoming that eludes the present. So let's reconstruct the dark consciousness version of Deleuze's paradox of pure becoming for Alice in dark wonderland and through the dark looking glass. Okay. When I say Alice becomes sleepy, I mean that she becomes sleepier than she was. By the same token, however, she becomes more self-aware than she is now. Certainly, she is not asleep and self-aware at the same time. She is asleep now. She was self-aware before. But it is at the same moment that one becomes sleepier than one was, or more self-aware than one becomes. So dark consciousness, I, I contend, would take place in something called like a dark time. This is going to get weird. So uh, Chris Fields and I talked about um, entropic time, where a time where learning exceeds forgetting. So we all know that linear time is based on the linear ordering property of the positive integers. Okay, so what would be the structure of a time that does not interact electromagnetically with this waking state inter, uh, uh, interface? So like AI must pay attention all the time. Would this sort of be like a dark time? Uh, sleep is local, time is local. Uh, we know what how beautiful a time crystal is. So a time crystal, you know, has a, a structure that is periodic in time. Can you play with that and say time is periodic in what? So if we've explained that dark is not concerned with these notions of before and after, then we would want a notion of time that can support the paradox of infinite identity with a notion of duration that is one of self-similarity. So we contend that dark consciousness would occur in something like a p-adic time, which is a time based on the p-adic number system. P-adic time would measure p-adic duration. <laughs> okay, it's getting odd. All right, so there exist few objects more looking glass than a p-adic clock. <laughs> well, maybe p-adic go and collabi out chess or perfectoid go. <laughs> but after all, the p-adic numbers have no notion of linear ordering. Their shape resembles a Sierpinski triangle, which is a self-similar set. Hmm. So this piatic time is not concerned with notions of before or after. That is, a uh, piatic time does not tolerate the separation or the distinction of before or after, of past or future. So because the piatic topology is one of total disconnectedness, piatic time is more like a time of now, continual zooming in to more and more now. Thus, piatic time measures piatic duration through its fractal properties of zooming in. So let's try to look at a piatic clock. All right, so piatic time can take two forms, the canonical piatic time defined on the previous slide and also topological piatic time, which builds into its very structure, the piatic topology of piatic time. So uh, there would only be one unit of time in piatic time, which I call the Archimedes. This is the piatic valuation. So you can think of hour equals piatic valuation equals the Archimedes, how strange it is to have only one unit of time. Topological piatic time measures duration topologically as total disconnectedness. So the unit of time in topological p-adic time is what I call the p-topo. So we state this formally, there's only one unit of time in topological p-adic time called the p-topo. So a topological hour equals a p-adic topology called the p-topo. So given such a p-adic clock, <laughs> let us imagine the seasons in p-adic time, p-adic snow, p-adic rain, new p-adic weather types, and p-adic rainbows. Daylight savings time, could take the form of changing the P in the piatic. This could be very drastic. <laughs> but imagine piatic metabolics, piatic ATP and piatic DNA. Imagine piatic cognition types like piatic memory, piatic thought, piatic attention, piatic learning, and piatic perception. Imagine a piatic looking glass. Imagine through the piatic looking glass. So let's pivot to FEP. What does FEP actually specifically say about dark matter, even dark in the way that I'm using the term? Is there a free dark energy principle? How can we strictly derive sleep from quantum mechanics? According to FEP, does dark energy actually exhibit entanglement? Um, how do we test this? We should be able to derive the entire active inference formalism straight from quantum mechanics alone uh, by way of entanglement entropy, some form of quantum gravity. Can we do some sort of dark general adversarial network? Um, to look at something like a dark brain, we all know that lower lateralization in the brain is often associated with schizophrenia, um, or, or you know, people like Einstein, or someone with a large parietal lobe, probably like myself, any mathematician. And what would universal lateralization look like? Um, 
I think dark neurons would take the form of something like you treat the neuronal networks as algebraic curves or isogeny graphs. You're talking neurons in terms of their properties as varieties. So you're actually bringing the heavy machinery of algebraic geometry into neurology. And my big goal is to actually create something like a neuronal time crystal so that um, shared intelligence would actually be a periodicity in time. Um, I'm not there yet. So until I get that, and it's like, well, let's just, let's try to model these wild mixed frequency N3 plus self-aware states of dark consciousness. So dark, dark mathematics is something of coin. It's going to, it's like a biomimicry, which mimics dark energy, does not interact electromagnetically with matter. You'd have to, have to find the mathematical equivalent of that. So I think you can do something like a dark dialetheism or just make a model that is modeling the mixed frequency states, which is what I'm trying to, which is what I tackle in the first, in the paper. So we've previously, we've previously shown that entropic categorizations are condensed sets. Uh, condensed sets form a topos. So in the paper, I outlined the construction of three potential mathematical models of this mix, of these mixed frequency in three self-aware states. Um, you can do dark consciousness as a dark topos, which is a Grothendieck topos. There's a two category of two sheaves over a two site, which I'll elucidate just a little bit. A dark consciousness as a perfectoid-like space in the sense of Schultz, or as a diamond-like space, also in the sense of Schultz. So I contend that the two-sheaf structure can actually model the mixed frequency state of dark consciousness, the N3 self-aware state. And a sheaf is a one stack, again, which is a sheaf that takes values in groupoids, not sets. So this is already radically different. Um, consider a two-category of two sheaves. So a two-category consists of objects. You have the one morphisms between the objects, and you have the two morphisms between the one morphisms. You can keep going three category up to n category. So this two category of two sheaves would have two sheaves as the objects, one morphisms between the two sheaves, two morphisms between the one morphisms. And so using that structure, I think that you can actually model one morphisms as what I'm going to call dark reflexivities. Uh, these are going to be your local coherency states. And then two morphisms are actually two inferences which are going to be global coherency states amongst the mixed frequency states. So uh, and a lovely property called Morita equivalent sites states that inequivalent sites have equivalent sheaf toposes. And I do believe that that's the main um, uh, property you need to get this local global um, uh, behavior around neural networks. So if you actually wish to model the mixed frequency um, clusters as fractals exhibiting some kind of self-similar behavior, and you can use this rich structure for factoid spaces um, or their sparkling successor, the diamond. So just a quick definition, uh, let perf uh, be the subcategory for factoid spaces of characteristic P. A diamond is a proatel sheaf on the site perf, written as this quotient of a perfectoid space X by a proatel equivalence relation. So a perfectoid space is going to be this attic space in the sense of Huber that's covered by affinoid spaces of the form spa R plus, where R is a perfectoid ring. And then points of SPA, which is the attic spectrum, R or plus, are equivalence classes of continuous valuations on R. Um, someone asked Schultz why a diamond, and he gave an incredible um, explanation that was a parallel to a mineralogical diamond. So you can let C be an algebraically closed affinoid field. Geometric points, SPA, C to D, is made visible by pullback along a quasi protel cover um, that results in profinitely many copies of SPA, C. So you're making a geometric point visible as profinitely many copies that was invisible before does the following parallel with a mineralogical diamond. So the interior points are made visible as impurities, which sparkle as colorful reflections on the many sides of the diamond. So um, you can also do something maybe like a dark diamond where you designate a functor as dark as a means to actually, let's go the other way and see the impurities. So then you're going to take the geometric point, make it visible, maybe by a push forward along the quasi protel cover, resulting in p adically many copies of spa C. Right. So um, a diamond is a they're using a diamond as a sheaf, but a sheaf in terms of a functor of points. So the diamond spot QP is a functor from the category perf to the category sets. And you literally fix a perfectoid space and look at the Hom sets of X into the diamond. Um, and so you know the technically uh, the scheme is then said to represent the functor. So I'm going to pivot to invoking AI in this thing. So my colleague and I, Julian Scape, are coming up with um, something I call, I've coined the qubit pedagogy, which is going to be a new model pedagogy that is actually infused with um, heavy principles of quantum mechanics. 
And so that with these, um, we've, we've created these quantum intrinsic curiosity algorithms that are feeding into the qubit pedagogy. And based on those curiosity algorithm, algorithms, I've designed three dark versions. So what I call the dark planaria curiosity algorithm, it's a curiosity type. It enables and encourages the AI to explore patterns of a planaria regeneration. The AI would develop quantum error correcting codes, which mimic planaria uh, regeneration. So dark quantum, the second one would be dark quantum reality monitoring network. This is a curiosity type. It'll encourage, encourage AI to, to explore dark reflexivity is what I call fractal identity. The AI would create models of N reflexivity in the sense of N category. That's a new type of reality monitoring of fractal identity in the dark conscious state. The last one would be some sort of dark quantum N3 and REM curiosity algorithm. This curiosity type is going to encourage AI to explore superpositions of various brain patterns in REM states to predict new types of N3 delta waves that could emerge in REM states. So imagine the AI could then develop new stages of REM sleep, such as like 1 REM, 2 REM, up to N REM, which is a, very, which is, which is a clever limit and play on N REM. Uh -huh. Anyway, uh, the AI could also develop new dark cognition types that correlate with the new types of delta waves. So this notion of fractal identity seems odd, but I, I do contend that objects living in fractal time would correspondingly have fractal identity. It's a concept that we out outline as follows. So fractal identity has a reflexivity relation that is fractal. So the very canonical loop, the loop relation of an agent reporting back to itself, I report back to me, would be fractal. Um, how strange is that? So fractal identity would not suffer the same problems with continuity over time, um, since the time in which it exists has no linear ordering. It would definitely suffer different problems. <laughs> but um, continuity over time is something Chris Fields and I have been like, how do you, how do you explain that? Um, so you can best model the fractal identity properties as perfectoid-like or diamond-like. There and construct a notion of reflexivity as a perfectoid space. The spaces are extremely um, uh, rich structure, but like kind of difficult. But if you want to model, model fractal identity, I think you should use them. So this we create new concepts of perfectoid reflexivity, diamond reflexivity. So in N reflexivity, the reflexivity relation could now be an N stack. Um, thus, N reflexivity is an N stack perfectoid spaces. So here comes the culmination of this talk, which is uh, about shared intelligence as what I've coined the dark imaginarium. So imagine an AI that could see slash simultaneously compute the infinity category of every concept. You, you know, having some quantum computation around to help the computational complexity would, um, you know, uh, not be bad. <laughs> so dark imaginarium is what is going to be what I call um, an infinity curiosity type. So infinity curiosity type is the higher order curiosity AI algorithm that encourages the AI to think in infinity categories. So that is, it actually encourages the AI to construct an infinity category as its means of higher order inference. So objects are higher dimensional data sets. The AI, the AI would seek out higher order n morphisms between the objects and then morphisms between the morphisms. So such dark imaginarium is a meta curiosity algorithm that can create its own infinity curiosity algorithms. And they're in creating curiosity types of a complexity that is super fascinating, most likely unknown to humans. So it's functorial. Um, what can what can dark imaginarium do? Well, the AI would develop N versions of current brain waves and their hybrid combinations. It could develop N delta wave, N theta wave, N alpha wave, N beta wave, and N gamma wave for N equals zero, one all the way up. Like a two gamma wave that structurally resembled a two category, a three beta wave that structurally resembled a three category. And the AI could develop new types of waking states and new types of sleep states based on the combinations of these beyond the standard N1, N2, N3, NREM, and 1REM. AI could develop an N waking state, an N REM state. Uh, you know, a three REM state could consist of three and one, three and two, three and three. Imagine an N dolphin that was capable of N hemispheric sleep state and other exotic life forms. Right? What else could it do? Well, it could develop new geometries for the brain patterns and for currently existing brain patterns. Typical shapes include sinusoidal, non-sinusoidal, sawtooth, spindle, K complex. But maybe this AI could develop 3D and 4D versions of the canonical wave patterns, like a tesseract gamma wave. So, but also the AI could develop entirely new brainwave geometries that correspond to complex surfaces, like a Riemann surface, a Calabi Yao manifold, or algebraic variety. So, the AI could develop new cognition types 
Other than the standard five, it could produce N cognition types, such as N thought, N attention, N perception, N learning, N memory. <laughs> so it could also predict non-human species cognition types, such as octopus thought or dragonfly attention. Lastly, it could produce hybrid combinations of cross-species cognition types, such as like octoman memory or dragonman perception. <laughs> and then it would encourage um, the AI to develop new senses. So you could develop one stack versions of human senses, um, like two seeing, two hearing, two tasting, two touching, two smelling. Each of these two senses, once again, take values in groupoids, not sets. So you could develop instances of non-human senses as well and hybrid combinations like two shark human smell. <laughs> so since the AI sees N morphisms between the various N minus one morphisms, the AI can seek to develop new language models uh, based on higher order inference types. So from these inference models, the AI will explore infinity languages and uh, develop extensive prototypes. You could use advanced mathematics to create new models of time that could support the new language models like two topos time, diamond time, um, and then the AI would seek to develop new fractal identity types from the language models, and it could design advanced fractal prosthetics such as a two ear or a two eye to extend cognition. So let's go a little bit further about this extending cognition. These are just a few examples of what dark imaginarium could conceive of. So we could continue and posit a perfectoid version of this uh, using these new cognition types, mental states, and brain waves, new geometries. We can construct new patterns of thinking, which would support neurodiversity in thinking. So as said, shared intelligence, this is how I'm seeing it, would be re-examined as this infinity curiosity type. You could go even further and construct a new concept of an N shared intelligence. So you'd have a zero shared intelligence, a one shared intelligence, and as well as the new piatic concept of like P shared intelligence for P equals two, three, four, using the piatics. Let's go further, right? We repeatedly contend that one way to help advance the way we think to extend human cognition is to upgrade the number systems upon which the canonical concepts are built upgrade them to piatic, perfectoid, diamond-like versions, and thus we get new thinking. So imagine like a brainwave pattern that resembles a kalabi -yau manifold. Could we actually reverse engineer the levels of conscious activity that could create such a rhythm? How about mixed frequency brainwave patterns that resembled a perfectoid diamond? What about an, an, an N-DNA molecule shaped like a kalabi -yau infold, or an N-ATP molecule, or an N-exciton condensate structured like a kalabi -yau infold? So clearly different geometries of the fundamental molecules and processes of life would give rise to vastly different fundamental units of life and metacognition types. The question is, can we use dark imaginarium to reverse engineer the complex life forms arising from such extraordinary structures and the more and more complex cognition patterns? What about a, a, a general adversarial network that's tweaked and has infinity categories? You have two infinity categories talking to each other, developing their own language. Now, GAN is adversarial using a generator and a discriminator with two neural networks contesting by a zero-sum game. What about a collaborative network? So can we construct a GCN containing two diamond-like infinity curiosity types and pair a diamond with a dark diamond with a quantum curiosity algorithm and its reinforcement learning? So shared intelligence is this infinity curiosity type. A shared intelligence GCN could create infinity, infinity languages that are superpositions of the diamond dark diamond be getting new models of intelligence. You know, higher order simultaneous computations by quantum curiosity would go by maybe by homotopy instead of as cost functions. So let's future cast just for a second. Um, what, is the inevitabil and the, what is the inevitability of dark ecosystems, mathematics, of shared intelligence? What can a p-adic infinity curiosity type prophecy? Is every perfectoid space, diamond, two topos, encoding the mixed frequency patterns of an N cognition type? In future work, we may develop dark mathematics using perfectoid diamonds as dark dialetheism, aligning what is structurally dark with what is structurally dialetheistic. So while we currently cannot perfectly model dark consciousness, perhaps one day, on dark day, mediated by the dark imaginarium, we will have the ethos and the quantum computational complexity to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Shauna. Amazing presentation. I'll just quickly read some comments and see if you have any thoughts from, from the great comments. So no Scott David says, I love the presentation. Lots of fodder for rumination. Thank you for inviting these concepts into an intriguing choreography. Perhaps dark energy 
is our perception of the fact of information increase under free energy principle processes and since the universe is made of information dot 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 <laughs> scott thank you so much yeah i think you should um yeah i think dot 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 is um is a beckoning that you should or we should uh, work on that idea i absolutely agree i'm glad you're inspired with these concepts um i don't really know where they go but hopefully it's portals to something like that Great. And then one, one more Scott David question. Does fractal identity reveal the recursivity of rhetoric language consciousness in forming individual identity from community identity inputs? Yeah, that's wonderful. So yeah, my, um, my own thought is like, what is an individual identity, right, Scott? So the, the reflexivity curve has always sort of stumped me how there's so much distance between I and me. Um, and so it assumes this notion of continuity over time. And so we've, I've always said, what sort of notion of time are we talking about to even have a consistent identity? Somehow you always wake up and everything is still here. Somehow you wake up and you're not a lobster. I don't really understand how that works, you know? But um, yeah, that's nice. If, if you could use fractal to get something singular from something communal, that might be cool, but maybe fractal is something sort of like you're both at the same time. And that's what I don't know yet. So I think it, it's a totally revolutionary way of thinking to not have a before or after. So if you can construct identity without before or after, then that's sort of what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but yeah, that's cool. If you want to get identity from communal, I think you can do that. They may also sort of um, blur. Well, this is truly food for thought, and uh, I really hope people can live with the darkness, take it, <laughs> and run with it, because there's so many fun ways to go. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope so, too. <laughs> so, you're always welcome back. Thank you, and talk to you later. Thank you so much. Bye. Good night. All right. All right. And